problem in preparing a lecture like this is how to make uh, ageing something that's interesting for people when most of us are trying to avoid it. Um, an overview of what I am going to cover tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about population ageing and its economic and social implications and its implications for the built environment, um, for housing planning and, and urban design and infrastructure. I'm going to be looking at policy developments in the field over the last uh, couple of decades at least, probably three decades. And then I'm going to be looking at two uh, aspects of research that I've undertaken on housing options and choices of older people. And then we'll try to uh, address the question at the end, are we prepared for an ageing population? I'm going to draw on two uh, Ahuri funded studies um, that I've led on. Dwelling Land and Neighbourhood Use by Older Homeowners, which was published in 2010. These are available, by the way, on the Ahuri website. Um, and Downsizing Amongst Older Australians, which was just published very early this year. Now, I, I want to note that, uh, that these are not sole projects. You'll see a list of uh, co-authors there who have been very valuable colleagues of mine in helping these projects to, to, uh, to be completed and to whom I'm indebted for their support as well. You'll notice also that the Dwelling Land and Neighbourhood Use project was also co-funded by the Commonwealth Department of Health and Ageing. The first question I think we need to ask is what do we mean by older? Uh, now there are various chronological thresholds that are used for various purposes. Um, 65 plus is used currently for, um, for because it's their pension pension eligibility age, but of course that's going to be changing in a few years and going up to 67. So whether that will change will be interesting to see. 60 is used for seniors cards in New South Wales and I think most other states. And 55 plus is used for uh, seniors housing and it also includes that group that are, are called uh, empty nesters and pre-retirees. So it really depends on what kind of study you're doing, what sort of thresholds you use. And you'll find in, the, in what I'm sharing tonight that uh, a number of different chef, chef thresholds are used in some of the data I'm referring to and indeed in the two studies I'm referring to. And I apologise, by the way, for my uh, shaky voice. I hope it lasts the distance. Um, so, should, But the question is, chronologically, chronologically is not really the best way to, to think about ageing. It, it, maybe it has more to do with uh, attitudes, lifestyles and abilities than it does with chronological, chronological age. But uh, chronological age is convenient to use and so most of the studies I'm going to be looking at tonight uh, will be using some kind of sometimes different chronological thresholds. Of course, the main thing in, in thinking about uh, what is older is that older people are an extremely diverse group um, and generalisations about them are very dangerous. So to illustrate my point, the photograph on, on the side there of my parents who are 94 years old, uh, still living independently without assistance, still involved in the community. My father still plays golf three times a week even though he had a hip replacement two months ago and they are undoubtedly an exception. I feel very fortunate that they, that they are but there are many people 20 or 30 years younger who are in a very different sort of situation. So this is just to illustrate the point that uh, ageing is a very individual thing and can, and can be very diverse. Now ageing as we say is not what it used to be. We think differently today about ageing than we did in eras gone past. Um, with uh, in gerontological theory has shifted from focusing on biological kind of aspects of ageing to biopsychosocial theories of ageing. It's a really multidisciplinary area. And from disengagement theory, which focused on uh, the progressive decline of people and their disengagement from society, to activity theory and successful ageing, which posit that remaining active and taking on new roles can maintain morale and well-being in older age. There are ecological theories that have emphasised the importance of social and physical environment in the ageing process and, and even political economy, feminist and critical theories that deal with power relationships, gender equality and so on. And of course these shifts in, in gerontological thinking have also come into the policy arena. And uh, so the sorts of, the sorts of uh, concepts that are now 
common in the policy arena are things like human rights and empowerment, active, positive and healthy ageing, uh, focus on inter inter independence, uh, ageing in place of course, and participation in the community. Just to give a bit of an international perspective, this graph shows uh, UN data uh, in t for ageing in, in a range of countries from 2010 projected to 2060 for those 65 and older. And you can see that Australia sits in, in terms of, uh, of where its position now sits approximately in the lower third of countries internationally um, and is expect at around about 14% and is expected to increase to just under 25% by 2060. And that's comparable with the USA, a little less than the UK and most of Europe, which is around 16 to 17% now, and a lot less than the world leader in Japan. However, in terms of overall growth in population ageing, by 2060 we're close to the bottom of the list, which is why we're in that position. St um, when we look, when we look at 85 and over, it's a different position. I and I'll, I'll be contrasting these two age groups uh, throughout my presentation because I think it's always important to keep an eye on the oldest old, older old, and those that are that are in the 65 or 60 plus category. So when you look at the 85 and over population, we move a bit further up the list uh, for 2060 projections, but we're still in the bottom third. You can see that growth in 85 and over is much more substantial in pretty well every country than in the 65 plus age group. And Australia's uh, 85s and over triple in percentage in 50 years, whereas Japan's more than quadruples. So if we think we have a problem, uh, look, look at Japan, it's, alre it's already the oldest country in the world. Uh, it's this that causes much concern about the social and economic impact of population ageing and of course it has implications for housing, urban planning and infrastructure. It's interesting to look at it spatially from a global perspective and this map from the United Nations Population Fund shows population growth of people 60 and over between 2012 and 2050, a 38 year period. So a slightly different uh, age and time frame than the previous graphs. It shows dramatic ageing over this period in the Northern Hemisphere particularly, and particularly Canada, Europe, Russia and China. Australia is also projected here to have at least a quarter of its population 60 and over by 2050, along with USA, Brazil and Argentina. But ageing is not just a global problem, it's an urban problem as well. The Global Cities Indicators Facility at the University of Toronto has just put out their global policy snapshot for 2013. So these figures come from their report which is entitled Cities and Ageing and worth, look, worth looking up on, the, on the, uh, the web if you can remember that title, Cities and Ageing. Uh, in 1900 they tell us 10% of the world's population lived in cities, 53%, more than half, live in cities today and 70% are estimated to live in cities by 2050. In terms of population growth, in 2010, just a couple of years, a few years ago, 522 million people in the 65 and over age group. In 2050, it'll be, it'll be 1,475 million people, which is a 183% increase. In Australia, we're a, bit, a little bit less than that. We're a 171% increase in that same time period. Um, and that means an additional 7 million people uh, 65 and over. So most of the population ageing will take place in cities. We know what the contributing factors are. These are the main ones, low fertility rates, low death rates due to increased longevity, advances in medical science and health education and of course the post-war baby boom generation entering old age and that is those of us who were born between 1946 and 64 and I assume that I'm not alone in this audience in that respect. Um, this accelerates population ageing for from the, from the early to mid to, to mid to the to mid late um, 21st century. So baby boomers come, uh, baby boomers are a different kettle of fish than previous generations. They come with a whole different set of values I know because I'm one of them and so are many of you, and we've come into older age with some very different attitudes and values than previous generations. Quine and Carter undertook an extensive literature review in 2006 and came up with likely uh, characteristics 
some of which we baby boomers may not be very proud of. And you can read some of them here, refusing to accept that we're old, uh, being more selfish, solely socially polarised, demanding and belligerent. Hope your questions don't come along on those lines later. Less accepting, trusting and conforming than their parents' generation, prioritised being in control, freedom of expression, individuality. To prioritise being in control, you can read Control Freak, I presume. Economically conservative but socially moderate swinging voters and expecting more from retirement than their parents' generation. Now, of course, this has a lot of implications for housing and built environment. So in terms of housing, the same authors say that uh, more than their previous generations, uh, more likely than their previous generations to live independently rather than with children or in institutions. They want to continue to be active, so they're active ages. They not particularly favourable towards um, <coughs> age-specific communities. They want to retain their existing uh, social networks. They're much more likely to live alone because of the high levels of divorce and separation. And they'll probably demand modified housing, specialised services techn and assistive technology, etc. And an age-friendly infrastructure and built environment as they age. And of course, in terms of their carbon footprint, um, that we're, uh, research out of the UK has shown that baby boomers have the highest carbon footprint of, uh, of any age cohort, so they're big consumers as well. So what does population ageing in Australia look like over the remaining of ma remainder of this century? This graph shows growth in the project projected from uh, 2012 to 2100, although it shows it in increments up to 2060. And we can see that uh, we can see that uh, it shows it for both for 65 plus in the dark columns and uh, 85 plus in the in the in the light grey columns. We can see that the percentage of 65 rises from 14.2 percent to 23.4 percent mid-century, and then to nearly 30 percent by the end of the century, which is 104 percent growth. And 85s more than double from 2.1% to 5.1% by mid-century and then to a whopping 9.3% by 2100. If we took it from the census years 2001 to 2051, as a rule of thumb, which is easier to remember, we can, we can say that, uh, that those, over six, those 65 and over are expected to double in percentage and the 85 and over to quadruple. So 85s and over are increasing at roughly twice the rate for 65s and over. And this, of course, has important uh, social and economic implications. Now, seeing we are talking about cities tonight, this shows us differences between cities in Australia. I hope you can read the names of the cities on the left there. So they're a little bit, it's a little bit dim. But how do our cities measure up in terms of population ageing? Well, this graph here... Uh, from the last major cities unit report, uh, may it rest in peace, looks at differences in population ageing amongst Australian capital cities. This time, just to confuse you, uh, it's the, the time frame is 2008 to 2056, a little under 50 years. The dark blue bar represents 2008, the orange and light blue and high and low projections respectively. Australia is in the top is at the top at around 13% in 2008, rising to, to the low to mid-20s by 2056. Unsurprisingly, the next two, Adelaide and Hobart, next two down in order, are the oldest and expected to continue to be so. Darwin at the bottom stands out as the youngest and is expected to remain so. Uh, in Sydney, in 2008, Sydney, Perth and Melbourne were quite similar, um, but do ha and Canberra, of course, is lower but it has, it has probably a higher expected uh, ageing growth rate. These are the sort of things that uh, concern governments. Uh, one of the major concerns is what's is best illustrated in what's called the dependency ratio. This is the proportion of working age people to those 65 and over, in other words, those retired. As you can see, this Pro Productivity Commission graph has, uh, it has been reducing dramatically in the last four decades or so. Um, from in 1970, from 7.5 to 2010, 
and 2050 to 2.7. What that means is there are 2.7 work uh, income earning people for, for, for those who are not income earning. Um, this is something of a concern for policy makers because of the increased uh, needs for health and aged care support services, reduced tax revenue, and, uh, and this is the consequences, what they call the fiscal gap. Now this was a projection that was done in 2002 when uh, former Liberal Treasurer Peter Costello commissioned the first intergenerational report as part of the 2002-03 budget papers. And they plotted this graph which represents the ratio of government revenue to expenditure. And it doesn't present a very happy picture. It didn't present a very happy picture. It shows that without any changes to policy, settings to the budget would go into deficit by 2015 and blow out to 5% of GDP by 2040-41. And they calculated that this would require an additional $87 billion in taxes. What they didn't uh, anticipate, of course, was the global financial crisis, the economic stimulus package and the mining boom. So this prophecy turned out to be quite untrue, but it was enough to kind of sharpen the attention of policymakers to the importance of population ageing on the economics of the country. Now, of course, this kind of story brings the alarmists and doomsday purveyors out of the woodwork. The term silver tsunami has been, has been coined and has been used regularly by the popular press, uh, particularly in the UK. There have been dire predictions from politicians and the popular press about the possible consequences. Fears of intergenerational warfare, social and political upheaval, fiscal crisis and even military aggression have been touted, giving inspiration to the ever opportunistic uh, cartoonists. And if you look carefully, the guy on the beach looks uncannily like Premier Barry O'Farrell. <laughs> Here's an example of this alarmist sort of literature. And we won't read it out, but I just highlighted some of the uh, emotive words that are in it, like fiscal crisis or hyperaging. We had hyperdensity in the last lecture. We've got hyperaging in this, in this lecture. Fiscal crisis, economic stagnation, ugly political battles over entitlements and, and immigration demographic storms, overwhelmed by massive age waves, explosions of youth. Uh, and this is from a fairly respectable newspaper, the Washington Post. Uh, social and political upheaval and military aggression were even going to be blamed on population ageing. Beautifully captured in this cartoon. Watch out, they're coming to get you. Now, there is, of course... Uh, even though such alarmism is exaggerated um, and, and un largely unwarranted, there are legitimate concerns about generational inequities arising from the reducing dependency ratio. The, we get asked the question, who are the biggest losers, the older or the younger generations? These are important policy questions. We're not particularly focusing on, the, on them tonight, but they are important. Uh, Organisations such as the London-based Intergenerational Foundation have emphasised the likelihood as, as stated in this uh, quote here, of an increased heavy burden on younger future generations who are seen as losing out disproportionately to older wealthy cohorts. And again, the cartoonists capture these fears quite cleverly. But of course, the more moderate and well-informed uh, opinions uh, prevail, if not in the major newspapers. Michael Curry, for example, a medical epidemiologist in the Queensland government, writes in the Medical Journal of Australia that population ageing will only have a limited effect on healthcare costs and that there's no evidence that population ageing will cause chaos for our health system. And likewise, the late Ellen G, professor and head of the department, uh, chair of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Simon Fraser University in Canada, wrote in the International Journal of Medical Epidemiology that the expectation of unsustainable costs was highly unlikely and that population ageing is not particularly influential for future public health costs. And if you read the literature, this is a fairly common uh, conclusion from informed people. I like what, uh, what Catherine Betts had to say. She said uh, that the, uh, from Swinburne University, she said the only way to return to the youthful age structure of the past is by having large families and dying young, and none of us want to do that. <laughs> 
So what are the policy responses to uh, population ageing? There have been a number of responses, some in the economic space, quite significant changes to the superannuation system, including things like the superannuation guarantee, tax exemptions for self-funded retirees, the increasing of employer contributions from 9 to 12%, gradually increasing the pension age, uh, which will start in 2017 and rise up to 67 by 2023. The baby bon bonus in an attempt to try to change the profile of the population, which had a slight effect. Why on earth people would want to uh, uh, commit themselves to a lifetime of hundreds of thousands of dollars for a three to five thousand bucks ex escapes me, but uh, apparently they did. Um, stamp duty exemptions uh, and concessions were, were, were offered by four states and territories. The New South Wales one has since ceased. Um, and, there, and the federal government in the last budget, we'll see if it survives the current one, has what they call the Housing Help for Seniors pilot scheme, whereby you could quarantine $200,000 of the proceeds of sale of a home into a special account and it wouldn't count towards your pension eligibility. So there have been a number of things in the economic space that, uh, that have taken place. Uh, the also the, 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 the Henry Tax Review had quite a lot to say about, uh, about these issues. In terms of the social space, there's been quite a lot of promotion going on through governments of independence and active healthy ageing. Uh, there's a lot of support for ageing in place. It's, 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 it's positioned as being a win-win. We uh, Older people win because uh, they get to stay at home and that's what they want and the government wins because it saves them a lot of money because uh, they, they s it prevents people from going into residential aged care, which is quite expensive. Of course, whenever there's winners, as any gambler knows, there's losers as well, and the losers probably are carers, and particularly family carers, uh, who often take up the burden of, uh, of ageing in place. Um, there's uh, been uh, progressive increases in the level of community care that's available in the home. This uh, table here shows how this has progressed over the last uh, 30 years or so, starting with the Home and Community Care Program in 1985, which provides assistance for people and home modifications, to the Community Options Project in 1987, which wasn't solely for older people, but did uh, include mostly, its, most of its clients were 80 and over, to the Community Aged Care Packages, which were started in 1992, and specifically targeted to older people and tailored to, to individual needs for a capped fee. And then there were two programs, Extended Aged Care at Home, each and each D, for one for the first one for frail, frail aged people and the second one for people with dementia and uh, behaviours of concern. And just more recently in 2013, these were all folded into a single program called Home Care Packages, which has four different levels of, um, of assistance, two of which relate to home-based care, two of which relate to different levels of, um, of residential care. So what about implications for the built environment? Well, when we talk about ageing in place, it's an interesting question to ask, what do we mean by what kind of place? Well, housing is the first kind of place and uh, so do we, do, do we, what do we know about, for example, ha what housing types people would or should or would want to, to age in place in? Is it, the, uh, is it, the, is it the, pr the family home that they've lived in for many years or something else? What types are appropriate? What sizes of dwellings are people looking for? Does it matter whether it's one or two storeys? Uh, what about the accessibility within the home? And within, within, and to the outside world, and and uh, the level of maintenance that's uh, that's acceptable for people wanting to age in place. Of course, the other aspect of place is the place is the neighbourhood in which people live. And uh, you know, there's many issues, planning issues that uh, impinge on population ageing as well. Uh, how how to provide housing diversity and choice that meets the needs of an ageing population how to locate services that older people are going to need as they age in place in the community, um, how you relate the housing location to those services and providing age-friendly neighbourhood and urban design so that people can actually participate 
freely in the community, or as freely as possible in the community. And in terms of infrastructure, particularly when it comes to public transport, convenience, accessibility, and safety of the public transport systems. Now, in terms of international policy, um, probably the most important one was uh, developed in 2007, which was the um, World, World Health Organization's Age-Friendly Age Cities Program, later renamed Age-Friendly Environments. And it was established in 2007 in the wake of a large international conference on ageing. They published guidelines on what constitutes an age-friendly city and invited cities to join an age-friendly cities network. To qualify, you had to commit to adopting the principles in the Age Friendly Cities Guide. And these principles were articulated under the eight themes that are listed there. Outdoor spaces and buildings, transportation, housing, social participation, respect and social inclusion, civic participation and employment, communication and information, com community support and health services. 33 cities initially joined the network. Uh, only two from Australia, Melbourne and Melville uh, in suburban Perth. So even though the take-up wasn't great in Australia, um, it certainly was influential on the thinking, particularly of local government organisations in Australia. And then, of course, there's been a raft of, uh, n of national housing and urban policy initi initiatives that, have, uh, that are relevant to uh, population ageing. Probably the first and most one of the most important ones was Anna Howe's paper that was written for the National Housing Strategy in 1992 called Affordability, Housing for Older Australians, Affordability, Adjustments and Care, which was a very detailed analysis of the housing situation of older people, drawing on a large survey that was conducted at the time. Uh, then there was the Australian Urban and Regional Development Review, which uh, emphasised also increasing housing choice and raised questions about the efficient use of the housing stock by older people. Uh, the National, House, National Strategy for an Ageing Australia, which came out in 2002, really emphasised the, the importance of independence and the whole of government approach to the, to the issues of population ageing. Um, in 2002, um, the disability standards for public transport were introduced, which provided accessible vehicles and, prem and, and transport premises, rolled out over a 30-year period. And then in 2003, the Prime Minister's Science and Engineering Council uh, looked at the whole t the issue of technical innovation in housing, neighbourhoods and transport. And uh, in 2006, the Department of Health and Ageing ran a, a, a lecture series which went all around Australia called a Community for All Ages, Building the Future, to try and bring the uh, whole issue of age-friendly communities into the public attention. And indeed, was based on some of the recommendations of that report that they funded our research or co-funded our research. Um, in 2009, the National Rental Affordability Scheme um, included accessibility requirements for, for older people and those with disabilities. In 2009 also, um, Bill Shorten, then um, par Parliamentary Secretary for Disability and Children's Services, um, pulled together uh, a, a wide range of stakeholders in what was called the National Dialogue on Universal Housing Design. They came up with a strategic plan which proposed 100% uh, of, or aspired to 100% of new housing to be universally designed by 2020. That sort of morphed eventually into an organisation called Livable Housing Australia, and in 2012, you'll see the second last one on the list there, they brought out their voluntary standards for housing, for u universal housing design. And that has three levels of performance and accreditation, silver, gold and platinum. And their aim was to have 100% adoption, and still is, I believe, to have 100% adoption at silver level by 2020. Just, m just last year, um, the Human Rights Commission uh, had came up with uh, uh, an, an advisory note on streetscape, public outdoor areas, fixtures, fittings and furnitures in response to requests from industry about what their obligations were under the Disability Discrimination Act. So there has been quite a bit of development uh, over the years. Also on New South Wales level, of course, we have the New South Wales level, we have the SEP5, 
State Environmental Planning Policy 5, um, which, which provided age-restricted housing for people 55 and over and permitted in, was permitted in land zone for urban purposes and set aside local planning controls. And that's morphed a couple of times in 2004 and 2007, as you can see there on the list with some changes. We had the, uh, associated with that in 2004, there was a seniors living policy urban design guidelines developed by the urban design group within planning. And in 2008, Landcom, you know, the state developer, uh, developed its universal housing guidelines and, and its planning for all ages uh, uh, considerations in their built form guidelines. And most recently, we have the New South Wales Ageing Strategy, which has a number of commitments in the, in the field of housing and, uh, and age-friendly communities. There are grants which they're, which they're giving to councils for age-friendly design community communities. They're, uh, they're focused on trying to improve housing choice and monitoring the supply of housing and uh, offering grants to older people moving and downsizing in later life. Peak bodies as well uh, have been active for, uh, for many years. Um, Australian Network for Universal Housing Design had been, has been very influential. Uh, it developed its top 10 universal design features and, and has since advocated for, since the uh, Liveable Housing Guidelines came in, has advocated for um, mandatory, uh, gu mandatory adoption uh, at gold level in the Building Code of Australia. Local government's been uh, quite active. The local Australian Local Government Association um, put out publication age-friendly built environments and has put out uh, best practice examples and case studies as well. National Heart Foundation with the, with the Australian Local Government Association and the PIA, Planning Institute of Australia, has developed their Healthy Spaces and Places guidelines. And uh, the Local Government of Association of New South Wales has also been very active in promoting inclusive and accessible communities and is administering the Age-Friendly Community Grant Scheme funded by the Office of Ageing. I've mentioned COTA in West Australia here. Most of the, all the others are New South Wales examples. The reason I mention the COTA example is it's a particularly good one. They established in 2012 what's called a Seniors Housing Centre with funding from their state government and uh, they have a, a very good Your Home Guide to Housing Options for Older People and they run seminars around the state of Western Australia. That's probably the, that's probably the best, ca best case example in Australia at the moment of a, of a peak body uh, getting into the advisory space when it comes to housing options for older people. And Cota New South Wales has a living communities project and, and, is, and, and runs creative age-friendly community workshops and, and has done so for 23 councils so far. So let's look at the housing, the households and housing of older people in Australians at present or in 2011, which is the most recent data that we have from the 2011 census. I want you to note a few things from uh, the following four, t four sets of tables. This one looks at the number of residents and you can see it looks at it for people um, 65 and 85 and over. Again, the dark bar 65, the light bar 85 and over. And you can see that the uh, ratio of two to one person household is about two to one. And 84% uh, of 65 year olds are in one or two person households. When it comes to 85 and over, even though the percentages shift between one and two, which we would expect given the increased longevity, longevity of women mostly, um, the percentage is still, pretty, is still very high of people living in one and two uh, one and two person households. If we look at dwelling structure, we can see that 70% uh, of 65 and overs live in separate houses, but half of uh, 85 and over still live there, which is a bit of a surprising figure for some people. The numbers living in s uh, semis and uh, row, row housing and the like and flats and apartments is pretty similar. And the main difference is the fact that there is a higher percentage of 
85s and over living in non-private dwellings, which generally means residential aged care. Uh, in terms of number of bedrooms, you can see that uh, three bedroom dwellings are the most common for both age group, both age cohorts. Um, and if we take uh, three and four together, which is looking at what we would say larger houses, uh, we could say that 73% um, uh, of 65 and overs live in three or more bedroom dwellings and 60% still of 85 and overs live in three or more bedroom dwellings. This is what uh, raises questions about uh, the efficiency of uh, housing, the use of housing stock or under occupancy. When we look at tenure, we can see that um, a little over two thirds of, uh, of 65s and over are homeowners, like fully owner, full owners, and uh, about a little under 10% owner purchases and you can see that even with 85s and over there's still quite a healthy number of them a percentage of them that are still owners because of the numbers we saw before that were in the in the in, in private housing so this does raise questions about uh, under utilization of housing and this has been referred to as the mismatch argument mismatch argument states that uh, older people underutilise their housing, they should be encouraged to move to smaller dwellings and that would release housing into the market for um, more deserving younger families with larger families. Now in Australia we've, we've used, we use, a, there is an official uh, measure of uh, occupancy and it's called the Canadian National Occupancy Standard you might wonder why we have a Canadian national occupancy standard in Australia. It's because we pinched it from Canada. And, uh, but we didn't pinch it without modifying it a little bit. But it's still basically the same. And most countries in the world have a, a measure of this type, mostly which are used for measuring um, over-occupancy or overcrowding. In our case, we, it's used more for under-occupancy. And I'll explain to you later on why I think that's a problem. The CNOS, as we'll call it, calculation, is basically relates the number of people to the number of bedrooms and it has a few special provisions for eight children in different ages and different genders to make sure that uh, um, it's reasonable in terms of who sleeps in the same room as who. As you can see there, children under five of either gender can share a bedroom, children under from five to 15 of the same gender can share a bedroom but not of different genders and adults, it's assumed, can share a bedroom. Now, in our study, uh, our utilisation study, the first one I listed there, um, we looked at people 55 years and over. So, and I apologise again for the change in, in, uh, in threshold, but it's important here because we were wanting to look at people who are in the pre-retirement group as well. We, we uh, had responses in our survey to for over, a little over 1,600 people Australia-wide and we did 70 face-to-face -face interviews in five states and territories. Um, and uh, we discovered that 83%, there's a list of 80s here which makes it easy to remember, 83% of were in households of one or two people in that age category, 81% were in detached suburban dwellings, 83% were in dwellings of three or more bedrooms and when we ran the uh, CNOS measure over Australian housing for people 55 and over, we discovered that 85, 84% of all dwellings of people 55 and over would be regarded as underutilised by a CNOS measure. Now this was uh, interesting because when we talked to people, when we uh, interviewed, when we surveyed people in the survey, they had a sharply different view. 91% of our survey respondents regarded the size of their dwelling as appropriate for their household's needs. So the natural question is why this apparent contradiction? Well, there's some interesting reasons. The first reason is temporary residence. Now you might say, what's a temporary resident? Well, there is actually an ABS definition for what a temporary resident is. A temporary resident is a person who stays at least 20 nights a year or more, but less than six months. And these are not included in the census, but they are included in the Australian Housing Survey. Unfortunately, the last Australian Housing Survey was run in 1999, so we don't have current data on this. But in the 1999 survey, 12% of all dwellings in Australia had temporary residence. 
what we discovered was amongst older Australians, or the 55 and over that we surveyed, 25% of them had at least one temporary resident, some had more in the home. Now this is an important finding because um, who are these temporary residents? Well, as you can see from the list there, uh, they're very often children. These would be adult children. They could be children that are returning from overseas and wanting to reposition themselves in the housing market. They could be uh, uh, children that have been divorced or separated and come back to live in the family home while they sort themselves <coughs> out. Um, it could be grandchildren. You know, grandparents, I heard on the news today, I forget what the numbers were, but a very high percentage of, 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 of grandparents are, are looking after children for very lengthy periods during the year. If you were to look after your grandchild uh, for every holiday as well, their parents work, you, they would probably come into a temporary resident category. And then there's friends, elderly parents, and uh, tenants and boarders. And what we found was that uh, people that... Uh, who were born overseas often had, had friends and family come to stay for extended periods of time for two, three months. Now, with these kinds of temporary residents, you actually need to have accommodation for them. The other factor was alternative use of bedrooms. Just because <coughs> there are things called bedrooms doesn't mean that people use them for sleeping in. They use them for other things. Now, this is not rocket science, but it's something that the CNOS measure doesn't take into account. Um, so what were some of the uses we found as spare bed bedrooms? And you can see some of the photographs there. Office was the most common one. And sometimes there were two offices because both retiring members of a, of a two-person household wanted to have their own space for, for office activity. There goes three bedrooms or immediately. Um, guest, guest bedrooms were very considered to be very important for visiting family and friends. It was pointed out to us by some residents that, that, that when their children left home, their family actually expanded because when their children came home to visit, they came with partners and with children. So they needed sort of guest bedrooms for visiting family, even though that might not, they may not be um, for uh, uh, 20 nights a year or more. Uh, hobby rooms. You'd be surprised how many hobby rooms we came across. You can see an example there of a... Of a model train set up in a bedroom. And the top one is, a, is an office set up in a bedroom and you can see an exercise, uh, r exercise and storage room there. So these are some of the uses that people put alternative bedrooms to and, and it was pretty clear to us after talking to people and taking photographs of, of, with their permission of course of their rooms that the sort of uses people put these, these bedrooms, so-called spare bedrooms to, were pretty important to their health and well-being. They didn't only use bedrooms for other things, but they used some of the, what would be regarded as surplus uh, living areas. Uh, rumpus rooms and family rooms were used for things like craft rooms, for exercise rooms and gymnasiums. A couple of them had quite extensive gymnasiums set up in a family room. Um, office and study rooms were often set up in family rooms where they, in, where they didn't have space elsewhere in the home and library and reading rooms and even television rooms or media rooms as those some people called them. And we even found that garages, spare space in garages was used for things that were very important for um, people wanting to potter around with workshops and the like. And some were used for outdoor living areas. Other considerations that people put to us in the interviews were that they, they, they wanted to age in the place because of their connections attachment to the home, the sentimental attachment to the home, uh, to the location that they lived in and to the local community. And you can see a quote there which sort of says that. Um, couples also said to us that they needed personal space for hobbies, for separate workspaces and to get away from each other. And in most cases that wasn't a sort of bitter and nasty negative thing. It was just that People weren't used to spending all of their time together uh, post-retirement in the home. The chuckles in the room suggest that people uh, may relate to that. Uh, the other thing that was put, sometimes people need to sleep in separate bedrooms for health reasons. Um, and uh, a number of uh, interviewees put to us that since they retired, they actually spent more time in the home, so needed more space in the home. 
which is something people don't often think about. We also looked at how they utilise the neighbourhood. Um, the dark bars here represent daily, weekly uses and the light bars monthly, yearly. We've conflated them to make the diagram a little bit easier. So you can see that on a daily basis, shopping, banking and retail is the kind of top activity. But sport and recreation is very important. Religious services, visiting family and friends, for more than half of the, uh, our uh, survey respondents, volunteering. A lot of people talked about volunteering in their local area. Community and social clubs. And if you look at the, the uh, facilities that they visit, that they utilise on a less regular basis, doesn't mean they're not important, particularly things like medical and health appointments. So we know from this how people use their neighbourhood and with what frequency. We also asked them in the interviews about what the barriers were to participation in their neighbourhood. And this was very interesting. We took photographs in the neighbourhoods that we looked at of some of the things people were talking about. And you can see some examples there on the, on the, in the photographs. Paths of travel was one of the themes, which means that they either didn't exist, like in the top photograph, or they were discontinuous, like in the second photograph, or they were poorly maintained or overgrown, as in the third photograph. Um, there weren't road crossings anywhere near where they wanted to cross and poor lighting at night time. And often this happened in, 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 in communities where there are high percentages of older people, for example, in some retirement, uh, uh, coastal retirement areas. Um, public access to buildings. There were still many public buildings that didn't have good accessibility in terms of stairs. They had stairs, didn't have ramps, handrails, and didn't have any seating for people to rest up in. Street furniture and fixtures, again lack of seating in many areas, lack of shelter, lack of public toilets was a big theme in the interviews. Um, as people get older they need to go to the toilet more often, they reminded us plenty of times. And poor maintenance of those facilities as well. In terms of public open space, sometimes it just didn't exist in very good proportions in the areas where people lived. Often it was poorly designed. An example would be that top photograph there where it's a retention pond as well as being a park, which means it has sloping grassed uh, verges, which is almost impossible for even you know, a young healthy person to walk down without slipping over, so hardly anybody would use it. Um, so often poorly equipped, poorly maintained public open space as well, but lack of paving in public spaces, lack of seating, lack of shelter, and again, lack of public toilets. Transport was a big theme. These three photographs I took the other day from the two stations nearest where I live, Warunga and Waitara, both of which are hugely inaccessible. So these weren't from areas that we surveyed people in, so I need to be uh, particular about that. But the sort of things people talked about were poor provision or quality of uh, service of uh, public transport, particularly in the outlying areas of cities, uh, waiting times, queues and crowding, and particularly at the sort of times of day that uh, older people want to, often they want to travel around at a different time of day than the peak hours, which is when the services are not very good. Confusing timetables and bus routes. We heard some wonderful stories about absolutely confusing bus routes. Um, and I know from my own experience working with public housing tenants out at Aids how the, how the the, the bus routes are totally illogical. Um, uh, distance or steep topography between where they lived and the transport nodes. Again, lack of seating and shelter at transport nodes, particularly bus stops. And stair-only access, as in the pictures there, uh, for st to stations and, and to buses as well. And crime and case safety concerns. Some people wouldn't use public transport because they were concerned about the safety around the transport nodes. So what we found overall was that with all of these barriers that lower income and outer suburban and some regional towns were usually worse, the worst in terms of this provision. That's not to say that they're all bad. Uh, some country re towns, for example, like Gunnedah have done very well. Gunnedah has a very well developed um, public domain which is very age friendly. So go to Gunnedah sometime and have a look. Um, others, which will shall remain nameless, if anyone comes from this town, keep it quiet, <laughs> uh, were pretty appalling. 
in terms of you can see discontinuous and uneven the path of travel. On the left there you can see uh, two public buildings with, uh, with uh, stair-only access, broken pavements and a pathway which dwindles down towards a bridge where you have to risk your life to cross to, to walk across the bridge with the, pa with the passing traffic. So there were some places that were at this end of the spectrum as well. So what do we say in summary from that study? Well, most people live in three or four bedroom dwellings. There's a high satisfaction with their dwelling size. The space is generally highly utilised. Alternative uses of bedrooms and other spaces are important for the health and well-being of older people. And these are all reasons why older people want to stay put rather than to move or downsize. In terms of neighbourhoods, participation was very important to them and barriers were very annoying to them as well, I would say. Barriers to participation. Uh, poor provision quality and continuity and maintenance of urban infrastructure were barriers to participation. And many neighbourhoods weren't age friendly and therefore were barriers to participation. I'm moving on now to the downside of the second study, the downsizing study, which leads kind of naturally on from the first one. Because once we've established that majority of people want to stay put, and of course the government wants them to stay put as well, uh, because through their ageing in place emphasis, uh, the question then was, well, what about those people who do move and downsize? So our next study was concerned with that group. We wanted to know, for example, or get an estimate of how many people did actually downsize and if why they did that, into you know, what kind of housing, what kind of outcomes, etc. And in this particular study, um, we looked at people who had turned 50 years of age because we were wanting again to go a little bit younger to capture people that were making plans for their ageing future. So again, I apologise for even a fourth fresh threshold of age. Um, we, in, we had uh, over 2,700 respondents to this survey and we did 60 in-depth interviews in three states. And we did a policy forum in each state as well to try and get, a, get the views of a wide range of stakeholders from government people to uh, peak bodies to the housing industry involved in housing for the older, older population. First thing we did was to look at the census data from the 2000 between 2006 and 2011 and see actually how many people how many people in the 50, 50 and over are downsized in Australia and it was surprisingly few it was 18 um, percent. Then we then we, we in our survey we looked at uh, the percentage of people who had downsized in our survey that came from that same co age cohort. We had a few in our survey who didn't so. We matched the cohorts, in other words, and what we found was that it was 50% of our of the equivalent uh, categories of people in our, sur our survey response had moved within that same five-year period. What this means, if we can extrapolate from one to the other, is that only if, if that only nine percent uh, of uh, Australians 50 and over are estimated to have downsized in a five-year period, which is pretty small number. So where did they move to? Well, where did they move from first? 98%, almost all of them lived in the general community rather than in, in some kind of uh, specialised uh, aged housing previously. 71% remained living in the general community. 21% moved into retirement villages and 5% into other seniors' accommodation. When we looked at the change in dwelling type, it was fairly dramatic. There was a fairly dramatic shift away from separate houses. The dark bar represents <coughs> previous dwelling, the light bar, the current dwelling. You can see that it's pretty much cut in half for um, separate houses or detached houses. And you can see where the growth is. The growth is in attached and row housing, flats and apartments. Now we must remember that that 21% of people who moved into retirement villages are also included in these figures because they're regarded as private dwellings mostly anyway, it's private dwellings. So that probably explains some of the growth in attached and apartment because m retirement villages could be either attached housing or apartments. When it comes to number of bedrooms, before and after, again the dark bar representing uh, before and the light bar after, we can see that 
majority or a large, the largest percentage was in uh, four plus bedroom homes prior and there was zero in that after downsizing. Um, mostly they were in, they were in uh, uh, two and three bedroom houses. What this kind of told us was that people, people who do downsize want to downsize into something smaller but not too small. That was a message we got from talking to people in interviews as well. A number of people said we want to move into something smaller but not too small. I want you to remember that because there's a bit of a theme in where I'm heading later in this talk. The change in floor area, we got them to estimate their floor area and about two thirds of people could do that, which was gratifying. Um, and uh, you can see the same sort of pattern there with the, 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 uh, the growth, particularly with having downsized in, uh, in 50 to 99 and 100 to 149 square metre uh, dwellings pretty much matches the, the bedroom sizes. So why did they downsize? What motivations did they have for downsizing? Interestingly enough, the, the, the most important uh, motivation was lifestyle preference, people wanting a change in lifestyle. There's a lot of discussion in the literature about people doing it for, uh, and in the popular conception about people doing it for financial reasons. Well, financial difficulties you can see there is, uh, is the orange bar the lowest orange bar, which is pretty well down the order of reasons why people um, uh, downsized. The most important reasons were the two dark bars at the top, lifestyle preference and maintenance, to reduce maintenance. You can see also there that there are some other factors. There's, uh, for example, children leaving home and retirement are up there amongst the higher ones. And then there are some negative shock type, what are called negative shocks relationship breakdowns, death of a partner, self or partner's illness, self or partner's disability, the light grey uh, bars there. So that explain, that's from that we understood why people downsize. And as I said before, mostly for lifestyle and maintenance reasons. We asked them also where they, where they got their advice and assistance from in the process thinking that there'd be quite a lot of people that would access kind of advisory services and things like that, but not so. Mostly from family, friends and real estate agents. Um, a few from financial advisors and some said, no one, we made our own decision. But uh, you can see relatively small amount from, uh, from popular media, from legal advisors, from seniors organisations. What were they looking for when they were, when they were searching for the new dwelling. Well, it's pretty clear what the message is here. It's they wanted less maintenance of the home and the garden. They wanted a smaller dwelling and they wanted lifestyle improvement again. There's where the lifestyle factor comes in. And then all the light bars are, are, are location related uh, issues. So we can say that maintenance, dwelling size, lifestyle improvement and, pro and, and uh, location are the important factors here. You can see some of those location factors, closeness to shops, public transport, health services, children and relatives, uh, friends, aged care services. And again, you can see that, the, that to discharge or reduce a mortgage is one of the lowest uh, items there on the, uh, on the list. Although to reduce the cost of living is a factor. So some people are making adjustments for that reason. Um, about 25% or about 26%, about a quarter of our, of our respondents actually found difficulty in the process. So we were very keen to find out what the difficulties were to help us understand what some of the barriers might be to downsizing. And uh, mostly it was about availability of suitable housing types. There seems to be a lack of supply of the sorts of housing that people would like to move into. I'll get onto that a little bit later as well. The cost and affordability of their housing was a factor. and. Uh, suitability of location. So availability, affordability and location seem to be the big factors there. Uh, most people were satisfied with their move. 90% were satisfied that with their move and felt that were satisfied or very satisfied with, their, with the outcomes of their move. 10% weren't. So this is a fairly small sample but it's an interesting response. If you look at what people said were the dissatisfactions, 
they're moving. A lot of them are related to issues to related to either strata title or to, or to retirement villages to do with for the highest ones there were building or village defects or maintenance and management issues. Um, some also were concerned that they'd moved into something which actually didn't have enough space for them, so they'd made a misjudgment. And for these people, affordability was a much higher uh, priority for their reasons for dissatisfaction. Some, of course, there didn't like cohort living. There was poor construction quality, crime and safety issues in some areas as well. When we, when we went to the uh, policy forums, uh, we asked them to identify the kind of barriers that they encountered in their work with their clients and, the, and, the, and their customers in the case of the, of the, of the building construction industry. Um, and, the and the types of barriers fell into these three categories, dwelling in locational barriers, financial barriers, and psychological and practical barriers. And uh, under <coughs> dwelling in locational barriers, the things we just mentioned before, difficulty of finding the right kind of housing that was smaller, accessible, in suitable locations, in other words, close to services. In financial terms, there were a number of things. The costs associated with moving, a lot of people were surprised at some of the costs associated with moving. Stamp duty is an obvious one. Removal of fees, temporary accommodation, and real estate agents' fees. And, and another one, which was storage, which I haven't listed there, the costs of storage for when they're in between living in one home and another. This can add up to a quite an enormous amount of money. If you look into the Henry Tax Review, they, they actually calculated what the total moving costs were across Australia in the different cities, and it's quite shocking. Um, and the psychological and practical barriers were emotional attachment to the home, the issues we raised before, the stress of preparation, preparing a house for sale, the stress of moving and difficulty sorting out and package and disposing of belongings to move into a smaller dwelling. So this was, we found this was interesting. We asked them what policy options uh, might be adopted to, uh, in to make it easier for people to remove some of these barriers for people. Age-friendly planning and urban design controls and mandated accessible housing design was pretty universally uh, recommended. Um, financial barriers, they recommended stamp duty exemptions or concessions and, uh, and uh, uh, exemptions from uh, the assets test, which subsequent to this study, the government actually did introduce. We like to think we might have influenced them in that regard, but I'm not sure whether we did or not. Uh, and they came up with the idea of last homeowners grants, which was an interesting one too. Um, <laughs> whether people would want to sign up to last, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, interesting idea. And for the psychological and practical barriers, we really do need, they felt, a much better advisory services and uh, by government and NGOs. And of course, the example from West Australia was an, that I gave you before is a good example of that. And they felt, felt that age-specific uh, financial advisors and removalists, people who are actually familiar with the issues of older people, would be very helpful. So are we prepared? Um, I think there have been some positive developments. When we look at some of the policy developments there, things have been chugging along. But I think there's still a way to go. Um, I think in terms of housing, three categories we looked at before, there has been progress with the access to premises standards and livable housing guidelines, but I think it's often it's agreed by amongst many people that these are unlikely to meet their targets unless they're mandated. I think we need greater innovation in the housing industry to provide housing types for older people that they want to downsize into. And we probably want less focus, particularly given the baby boom generation, on specialised housing or age-specific housing and more on inclusive housing in the general community that's suitable for older people. In terms of urban planning, we need planning and development controls to encourage housing types that are suitable for older people and that are close to amenities and services. And we need some national inclusive urban design guidelines, which has been a bit patchy. And the ones that, we, that were developed just recently are pretty much motherhood statements. They don't get down to specifics. And they don't mention anything about much about population aging. 
Um, in that regard, I'm not sure that we, what we need is, uh, is age-friendly guidelines to add to all the other lists of guidelines. I think what we need is good design guidelines which are inclusive of older people and other groups in the community as well. In terms of infrastructure, uh, the slow rollout of the disability standards for public transport is a real problem and you can find that by going to many railway stations and trying to get on many buses around Sydney. Um, and I think that has been under review for a number of years and needs to be reviewed and sped up to match the, pro the pop popula rate of population ageing. Now just as a postscript, keep you for a few more minutes, this is a picture of uh, a residential area in uh, Ramsgate. And as I was preparing this talk, I was reminded of the fact that when I did my PhD many years ago, when Alec was a student of the same institution, um, uh, I, was I did my research on new forms of medium density housing that were developing at that time. And amongst those were the, what, what was called villa homes, which are these single storey uh, clusters of houses built on residential allotments previously occupied by a single dwelling in the Rockdale, Cogra, Ramsgate area. And what I discovered in my work was, particularly in interviewing and talking to people, was that these were attractive to a lot of older people because they were in the same area that they were li had lived in previously in a larger house. They liked the fact that they were in the same community. They were smaller but not too small. They were single level. They weren't universally designed, but one could imagine that without too much trouble that could be arranged in a, in a, new, kind of, in a new kind of mode. They weren't very beautiful to look at. Uh, they weren't very smartly designed, as you can see from the examples there. But they, they, were, they, were, they were affordable because they were permitted to be built in residential A areas, which meant you weren't paying a premium for the land, and they could be constructed with normal cottage construction techniques. So they were very economical and very attractive to people downsizing. And we've kind of lost them a bit in the general housing market in, in Sydney in, recent, in, in subsequent years. Now, of course, there are some well-designed examples of housing like this. And seeing this as the Utzon lecture, I thought appropriate uh, way to end would be to show some, some Utzon uh, attempts to uh, design housing that I think would be very suitable for, w which matches the kind of profile that I'm talking about. Of course, one of the, probably the most famous uh, of Woodson's housing developments is the Kingo houses in Elsinore in Denmark. And I've noted there they're smaller but not too small. They're single level. They have a small garden. They have low maintenance. They're not particularly universal design if you look into them because they do have narrow corridors and probably bathrooms that are not very accessible, but that could probably be arranged if uh, Utsun were here today. The second project, and this that was done of course in 1961. In 1963, Utsun did a second uh, project called in, in Friedensburg in, uh, in Denmark, and this was actually commissioned by a, a company who wanted to provide housing for returning pensioners returning from working overseas. So this was consciously designed as pensioner housing. And these, likewise, these are smaller but not too small. They're single level, they have a small garden, they have low maintenance, and they're much closer to universal design solution. If you look at the plan there and you can see much detail in it, I apologise that it's not bigger, you'll see that there are no corridors in this house for a start. Um, and the bathroom, although probably not accessible, um, wouldn't be too difficult to design a kitchen and a bathroom in that kind of configuration that did... Uh, meet um, age-friendly requirements or universal requirements. So the namesake for these lectures has, 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 done, has designed housing that I think meets the criteria and perhaps presents a model for how we could approach uh, housing in Sydney today. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>